Hi everyone, thanks for coming to our talk, Patronage Today and Beyond, a system of support and friendship. Please give a warm applause to our speakers, Alan Survey, Alan Lowe and Jam Akuza, moderated by Patricia Chen. I will firstly introduce the speakers and then I will let them begin the discussion. So we have Alan Survey, who is an entrepreneur and a passionate collector of contemporary art and a frequent commentator on the art industry and market. He is also a member of numerous art juries and committees, including Art Basel's Council of Global Patrons. Alan Lowe is co-founder of Duddles Hong Kong and is active in promoting art, design and creativity in Hong Kong, having served on a number of boards, including the Design Trust, which he chairs, Art Basel's Global Patrons Council, the Tate Asia Pacific Acquisitions Committee, as well as Parasite. And we have Jama Kuza, a businesswoman and art enthusiast. She is the founder and director of Bellas Artist Projects. Bellas Artist Projects is a non for profit, non collecting institution that supports and engages with art that is experimental, educational, accessible, with a satellite space in Manila called Bellas Artist Outpost. And our moderator, Patricia Chen, is a filmmaker and arts writer. She is the series producer, director, and author of Leading Patrons of Asian Art in Conversation. Chen has also contributed widely to, the f to Flash Art, the Art Newspaper, Financial Times, and Art Market Report on the Asian art scene. I'll let the speakers take the floor. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. Well, this is too formal for me. Um, <laughs> let me just paint the context of the discussion today. Now, we're talking about patronage. In the art world, patronage in, in the olden times, you know, we, we define patronage as the offer of support or encouragement, maybe by church, by the Pope, by the king, by rich and wealthy individuals. But what is patronage like today? So I actually put up, you know, just a, a, a kind of a mind map. Um, we, you see this in many forms because I think what is traditionally associated with patronage is art collecting, which is buying works for private collection. Now, if you actually see this, it's only one of maybe 10, nine or 10 um, areas of support. So it can be collecting, it can be archiving. What examples can you think of when we think about patronage through archiving. Indo Art Now. Okay, Indo Art Now actually um, is an Indonesian initiative and um, they collect, they consolidate um, all exhibitions and they publish it online. Um, any Indonesian's exhibition around the world. I think that's a kind of patronage. Um, then you see the Digital Museum. What exam examples can you think about? The DSL, right? Virtual reality. Then you look at donation and gifts. Well, that's quite common. You, you, well, an immediate example might be an Ulisic, um, you know, arrangement with M+. The other one is private museums, which is very common nowadays. You think of Yavuz, uh, sorry, you think of uh, Yus Museum, you think of Ulans, you think of uh, Machan in Indonesia. Then, of course, the other one is loans. So what we, the people we have today, um, are patrons that contribute in this four other areas that you know are, I, I feel uh, are quite important today. Um, of course, the first is collecting, and that's the Elan. Uh, he collects. He has been collecting for about twenty years. Uh, so his is a, a uh, so he actually housed his collection in a loft, in a former residence. And then he found a way to introduce a kind of a casual structure or way of involving artists uh, in residency in his space in Brussels. Um, Jem. Jem is from uh, Bilias Artis um, in uh, Manila uh, and Bataan. Um, and hers is in the form of patronage in the forms of art projects involving artists. And we will leave her to tell you more about what you know, she's getting involved in. And Ellen is um, what, in, in this map of mine, it would, I would call it a lifestyle business. Now, with Ellen, his, the involvement of art is through a business. 
and in this case in is restaurants in Hong Kong and London recently. So I'll be asking questions about, you know, um, uh, formats involving art, does it need to be in a certain form? Can we be more open to other forms? Uh, do they need to be palatable? Uh, what about the future? What about the social media? Can patronage also happen through the social media? And I think Elan is actually very well known for that and we will actually talk to him about that. Okay, so maybe just to start, um, Elan, would you like to tell us how did you, yes, how did you get involved in your current, the, the, the way you structure your patronage today? So, Patricia asked us to adopt a very particular format, is that she said our answer must be maximum 10 words. So <laughs> she do the talking and we answer. So in 10 words, how do I start my patronage? By chance. By chance. Okay, By chance. can you describe a little bit more about when that happened and how you actually got into collecting uh, and then artist residency? The way you um, recognize um, a collector or an accumulator of, 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 of objects is by curiosity and experimentation. So the chance is just that um, the patronage started because I realized that art was done to be shared um, and no, no other particular reason. Owning it uh, didn't make sense, so it never made sense for me. I had the chance to live with it. Uh, I started getting into art because I love to go to museums. Um, I worked in Wall Street at the time and um, I, I noticed how peaceful I was when I was going in a museum. I was kind of forgetting what it was around, so I said, if I can repeat the experience in my own house, I'd, I would do that. So that's my first experience. The second experience is I love to visit private collections somewhere else. So I said, if I visit private collection away, I should give, the, uh, the, um, I give, should give it back when people are visiting me. So I started opening my space. Then a third experience is I hated when I visited the same collectors o the years over, and it was exactly the same collection at the same place. So I said, why? Well, I hate that because I know they're buying more pieces. Um, and and the, I realized that the work bec became ossified by, by just being never changing. So I, I started changing myself with great difficulty because I remember I acquired a Gilbert and George. I never thought I would have a Gilbert and George in my life. So I said, wow, I don't want to take it down. Then I said, yeah, but I'll make be logical. Um, uh, if you keep buying, you need to replace. So I took it down, I replaced it, and I was very happy. So third level of experience. Then fourth level of experience, I moved my house. And at the time I was closing the door, I said, this is really ridiculous. You know, in a time when people have difficulty lodging themselves, um, I'm leaving a space where I lived happily for 10 years. My bathroom is there, my kitchen is there. So I said, let's do a residency. Um, and then I, st I opened, so by chance, this is why I said this is by chance, I had a residency and I had a space to, um, to, uh, to exhibit the collection. Excellent. Now, um, we're going to come back on how you run that residency in your loft. But uh, before that, um, Jem, can you actually tell us about how your inherited situation, um, how you got involved in setting, this, um, setting up the artist residency and, and then eventually uh, the outpost in uh, Manila. Ten words. Oh no. Okay. It can't be more. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I came from a very unique experience or, or background where, well not unique, but I studied abroad for around ten years almost um, and uh, basically in London and in Paris and then when I was asked to move back when I was around 25 years old, this was 2013, and um, my parents had told me to work in the family business, which was construction and real estate. And uh, part of my life I had to let go of in, in Europe, which was my life in the art world, or like that kind of being immer immersed in art. Um, and coming to the Philippines, I had very little knowledge of the local scene, um, uh, getting kind of acquainted with um, the commercial galleries and, and some of the museums. I, suddenly wanted to become a part of it and so 
um, negotiated with my parents and said, uh, I'll fully move here and you have my total commitment if you let me do art projects. Um, and it made perfect sense because my father has this, like, um, he has this collection of Spanish colonial houses um, three hours away from Manila. Um, it's an ar architectural sort of project of his where um, he um, takes all these abandoned Spanish colonial houses, uproots them, and rebuilds them in one area. Um, as a result of that, we've had an organization of hundreds of craftsmen that are constantly working in that, um, in those architectural spaces. What do you mean by uproot? How do you uproot a so, house? So, um, uproot is maybe a metaphor to the more, um, to the actual um, act of taking the house, but it was, uh, um, these houses were dismantled, transported, brick brick. and then rebuilt. Um, and brick these, by brick. Brick by brick um, and plank by plank. Um, so most of these houses are made out of wood and stone. I would say like 60, 70 percent out of wood. And um, coming from uh, being an antique collector, he realized that a lot of the antiques that he was buying were parts of old houses. So in his mind, he thought, why don't I just buy the entire house and rebuild it? Um, and so that way I keep the house and um, the parts of the houses also don't get um, sort of uh, ripped apart and then um, sold to different uh, collectors. But basically, part of the, the, all these resources made a lot of sense to me to create like a program where we could invite artists for residencies and they could respond um, not just to the in rural environment of Bataan, but also to be able to experiment with the craftsmen that are living there. Mm. And, and, and we'll come, come back to your outpost later. And Ellen, you are a restaurateur, and can you actually tell us how do you, uh, well, when you actually set up your restaurant in Hong Kong, um, it was under a different name, different group, but how did you actually transit into this, uh, the, the current rendition at Duddles um, involving art? Uh, timing, I think timing was, was key. Um, opportunity. Um, it was it was a space that that <clears throat> you know the opportunity to um, to do something in a space that it's right in the heart of the city. So then, when you first set up in in Hong Kong, can you actually tell us uh, the first uh, restaurants that you set up and how? Uh, so in terms of opportunities, you meant location. Uh, if in terms of opportunity, you meant the readiness of patrons to 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 dine in. Timing. I think. I think. With. I think. With. In terms of. In terms of. Um, how the city has sort of grown to become. Um, you know. I don't want to say a hub, but I guess um, uh, when when the city develops itself to a point where you feel it's ready to have a place to have different types of art-related conversations. And 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 um, and you know, you combine that with an with a kind of a real estate opportunity um, in the heart of town to create something special or something that no one's ever really done before. What is your own background? Um, trained in architecture, never practiced. Um, we opened our first restaurant in two thousand and six in Hong Kong. Um, and um, we've developed, um, you know, together with Classified, which is our our, um, our European neighborhood cafe concept, which we now have about eleven locations in town. Um, and with um, <coughs> myself and my two other partners, we we took the company public in twenty sixteen. Um, but I guess you know, owing to the opportunity as well as. Um, as well as, uh, you know, so so happens my wife is also a, a, a hotelier turned restaurateur. So it was, so Dados was actually the first project that we collaborated together. 
And what is the what is the mandate of this particular space, and what's the thinking of the involvement of art? How do you decide how much of art? What in, in during that time was it? Uh, it it must be quite common for art to be hung on walls and paintings, but you, if you actually see your projects, they are actually much more than that. Now, how do you go about deciding what uh, the format and how much space, how much, how do you present that? We set out to do. We set out to create this space where um, those who are professionally involved in the in in the arts or have an interest in art can eat, drink, and socialize. So that was that was the that was kind of the the statement that that we created before we kind of dived into kind of the specifics of you know programming and everything. Um, we we actually. It was. I mean, it's 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 funny because um, you know, you know, um, like people in the art world are really bitchy, <laughs> and they're very judgmental. So it was quite the uh, the thought of creating a space that involves art was pretty scary to me. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. So I actually, so I actually like way before we um, we opened. Well, it wasn't way before. It was maybe like a few months before we opened. I actually created this is Duddles. This was Duddles. We, Which I, year I, was that? It was 2012. Okay, yeah. Please. So it was uh, just a few months. We opened on the very week of Art Basel Hong Kong's first edition, which was May 2013. So <laughs> late 2012, I decided that I would create a little town hall. So I created a little private town hall with. Some uh, uh, friends of mine who are, you know, who run residency spaces, who have who are curators, who are, you know, board members of nonprofits, collectors, uh, journalists. I just sort of, you know, just it would, there were about the collectors. I mean, there were about 10, 12 of us sitting around, and I said, "Look, I'm doing this thing, and I just want to hear you, hear me out. This is kind of the idea. What do you all think?" And. I think half the room really embraced it, and half the room absolutely hated it. Who hated it, and what what was their profile? I didn't like? want to say who hated in, it. But are, are they like <laughs> no no no? As in, are they curators? Are they artists? Uh, are they are they art fair managers? Are they gallerists? I think you have like the the, I think. You have, the the. Um, the patron type, like the board members, they kind of like thought, oh, this is such a great idea. And then you have, you also have like, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed bag actually. It was, it was, you know, just, I think overall people felt that it was a good idea, but then I think there was a, just a number of people who felt that one can never be able to pull it off in a way that is critically, that will be critically accepted. Like in terms of, you know, Oh, you know, it's just gonna be. It's just gonna. It's just gonna be like you know, one of those. So did you like high, you know, uh, uh, high-end places where you know the 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 wealthy congregate and you know there's a few things of art on the wall. And you 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 set out to. It was good. It was actually a very very helpful, exercise like conversation because then, we really had to think. Re like hard to 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 really asking serious questions. So how do we do this, and how do we do it so that so that it's not just a few you know things of like paintings and art on the on uh, around the space, but that's actually some form or shape of a platform that well, is actually that actually whether in a big or small way contribute to the community. So what were you after? Were you, were you after engagement? Were you after education? Uh, were you after visibility for artists? Or uh, an environment? I mean, we wanted people to have a good time, but at the same time, learn, a little, learn something and, right. and, and engage in, in art. And, you know, you know we're, not a, we're, not a, we're not a museum. We're not a commercial gallery. We're, we're kind of that in-between. So, mm. And I think, I, I guess timing-wise, it, it comes in... It's timely because obviously we it w we were still years before M plus was gonna arrive, and and um, and because of the the kind of the the, the the crazy real estate situation, you know, the fact that you have a space in the heart of Central, which is the banking as well as the gallery districts, to to create to be able to do 
different types of projects and have conversations and you know see an art film and 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 uh, and engage in it, 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 with this dif different spectrum you can it can be very serious or it can be very social as well sure Elan, if if you were to be sitting in his town hall where would you what would you what would your vote be would you be the people who who would agree or disagree and why I have no problem with that. Um, I think one of the big problems in any discussion about art is about defining what art is. That's the key thing. You know, again, I, I will repeat my key word that you need to leave, keeping them. If you start collecting art, curiosity and sense of experimentation, you know, the work that we're going to buy is the one that is now in the lounge here outside. Just think about it. This is what we're buying, first thing. Second thing is, just ask yourself, every time you're approaching art, what is art? You know, sometimes you see advertising, is it art? You know, sometimes you see people define art in different ways. So a question of what Alan does is, is art to kind of create the, the right uh, experience in the right environment. We could even compare that to music. You know, there's a, 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 a full movement, recognized movement with the, the top hits and lower hits of um, elevator music, you know. And again, there's nothing bad about elevator music. It's just about not challenging the people, making them in the right mood. You know, look at what Abercrombie is doing. You're getting there, and the level, the volume, and the kind of music they show is supposed to uh, entice more, more buying. So Alan is a restaurator. I, I totally respect that he, he creates a brand and a, an, exp an, exp ex an experience, and this kind of Art Cafe has been um, some, a strong business in Chelsea as well. You know, the big galleries uh, opened uh, their own restaurant. They create, and, and as they're entertaining a lot of people, it's a good way. So in my opinion, it would be no problem. Is it, is it the same thing as I am doing? No, because me, if I, want, if I bring you home, I want you to be kicked in the ass. Uh, I love when people say, to me, oh, I love your collection, but I could never live with, uh, with it. Um, you know, I love, and so it's another kind of art, another, another intention, it's, it's nothing to do. It's just, I want people to be disturbed. And disturbed means thinking, uh, thinking about different things. Again, I'm repeating, look at the work that is outside here in the, in the courtyard and think about what it means. Um, and if, if you're interested in there, you know, go more into contemporary art. But I've got no, no, I, first of all, I went to Alan's place and I, it's a very pleasant place. Um, the dim sum might be expensive to tell you the truth, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that I get a discount. Someone has to pay for it. <laughs> I, I'm hoping to get a discount next March, so. <laughs> but it's, it's a very pleasant place and you know, I, I have no, it's, it's no position, but always think for yourself, what is art? Um, and one thing I'd like to add is art is not especially a painting. Because Barbara Kruger once wrote, she said, you know, it's a very strange um, thing that any trace of painting on a canvas is always considered art. But that work in the courtyard, I would have to justify this is art or not art. So in every level, ask yourself what is art and try to go over what you think. You know, art is about curiosity and experimentation. Otherwise, go to the shopping mall. There are many shopping malls in Singapore. Don't waste your time in art galleries and museums. So what are you saying that if we present art with in, in, in an environment of distraction, when, they are, uh, when it's not a white cube, when it's not a project space, is equivalent to uh, listening to elevator music? No, it depends how it's presented and what you want to do. Let's say, let's speak about corporate collection. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm always astonished that there are good curators, but a corporate collection is always about mm, how not to disturb my clients. You know, that's mm. what it is uh, mm. at the end of the day. So it's very logical because it's still a business they have to 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 give account to shareholders. So, mm. I, and it's not about the white queue because I learned. Um, very much that a good work of art would work against a white wall, a pink wall, um, a gray wall, against no wall, and, uh, and anything. So it doesn't matter the, 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 the environment. The context maybe is important, uh, definitely, uh, in some way, but um, you know, the color of the wall is, is, is not. 
Jem, I'm going to come back to you. I, I'm, I'm just going to put the point back to Alan. Alan, <laughs> you know, he talked about the environment um, that is very focused on art, creating that environment. Now, in your environment, uh, it's just not possible because it's a business, right? Um, now, when I understand it, that you engage curators in all your projects um, involving art. Now, is, is that one, one of your consideration when you actually present art in a lifestyle kind of a space, a public space? Um, <clears throat> first of all, we, I think we made a conscious decision to, to engage um, Ilse Crawford from London to, to, to design the space. Um, you know, at the time we, we were looking we, we wanted someone who has that kind of a certain level of understanding of culture in order to, um, you know, to, to be part of creating you know, this concept. So it's not just about creating a space that is beautiful, but it's, all, it's about creating something that um, becomes kind of like a, 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 kind of a, like a, a canvas that is blank enough so that you can do different different things and it's because oftentimes you walk into a beautiful you know upmarket type of space it's almost a little bit too there's too much going on material wise as well as design so when when your curators actually um, hang paintings and 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 present the artworks you know in the environment where people are eating uh, do we they don't, well, we don't hang paintings when people are eating. We hang. We, oh, no, no, no. In, in that environment, paintings. they don't sleep at night and then they hang paintings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the environment, <laughs> in the environment. So are they? Are they also very, very? Uh, because they come from the art world, right? Are they also very uh, particular about that space that uh, to create uh, to create a space that is? Well, we we make it a we. So from day one, it was a curator led. It was a curator led yes. program. So I. Yes. I've never curated a show. I don't <laughs> consider myself a <laughs> professional curator. So I think we, we made it very clear that it has to be, it, you know, it, we work with Hong Kong based curators as well as, uh, uh, you know, China based curators, international curators, as well as institutions. You know, we've done, sh we've done uh, shows with Dallas Museum, we've done shows with ICA in London. We've collaborated with the Biennial Sydney. We've done shows with, uh, you know, with uh, UCCA. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not your typical kind of purist institutional type of space, mm -hmm. but I, we, we, we actu I actually personally find it, well, conceptually, we, we, the, the brief I gave to Ilse Crawford at the time was to, to, to create a sense of, w as you come into the space, kind of walking into a s the, the home of a seasoned collector. So it's oh. almost like you're going into a collector's home for dinner. Mm. Um, so in a way, I mean, uh, for, from a curator's standpoint, I think it either you love it or you hate it. I mean, it's it's, and uh, and, it, and and there's a little bit of a challenge also. I mean, in terms of just yeah. Sure. Yes. Um, I think. Hello. Yeah. I think there's no problem with what you do with your restaurant how you want to curate it or add an art element to it. Yeah. There's, you know, you can do whatever you want. And I think um, it's really great that like other spaces, you can see it like even in the Philippines, a lot of um, malls, you know, it's the same in, in Hong Kong as well. Restaurants are suddenly really excited to have, like do something art related um, into their spaces. I think the question that whether it makes it interesting or not is context. Like, you say that you bring in all these curators, and what I find has been the most interesting sort of experience of walking into, let's say, a mall, or, I mean, in some cases, uh, I think, was it Damian Ortega who did a, an installation in a supermarket? Mm -hmm. Like, how, like, what is the context that you're interested in? How, uh, you know, we throw in a lot the word engagement, always problematic, same with pa patronage, but <laughs> it's also a very problematic word, but let's not get into that. But this idea of like how you're engaging people and how you um, like kind of play around with the context of the space. Um, and that kind of informs whether you, what kind of um, art will engage the people, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
But it's still a very difficult thing because um, we must admit that showing in a shopping mall is incredibly difficult. Um, in Hong Kong Central, for example, for me, any gallery is embedded in a, in a shopping mall. I mean, it's extremely difficult to, to make sense and to create um, content because it looks like an object very much. Um, the same uh, in, for, it's probably too far away from here, but in Aishti uh, Foundation in uh, Beirut, uh, Tony Salame has got his space inside a shopping mall looking like a Marina Sands, and it doesn't work um, either. And I really understood the importance of that is that another case in a totally different way was, um, um, uh, Oliver, you can tell me, what was that fair in, um, in Los Angeles uh, in, a, in a kind of a studio? Sorry? Paramount. So there was an art fair in, um, in, a, form, in a former studio for where Western were shot. Were shot. And it was, so they did an art fair in there, but it didn't work at all. Because imagine yourself in the, um, the background of a, of a Western, you know, like a bar and all wooden things, and, and you have Chantal Cruzel's work um, of the gallery shown in there, and I, it didn't work a second. So th there must be a limit um, in terms of creating context. Uh, it, it doesn't work everywhere. I, I, I think what I mean by context is you know, creating a museum context inside a mall often doesn't work. When you say, I'm gonna build like a museum show in the middle of the courtyard next to Prada, Louis Vuitton, and whatever. Um, it's more like, and I think this is key when working with curators, because depending on which curator you work with as well, they will be able to kind of think of ways to kind of Within the context of the mall. Yeah, understand oh. a context that they want to work with and which artists to bring in and give, I mean, also freedom is so important when you, dis when you work yeah. with these spaces. Like walking into a mall with a barricaded, let's say like Anish Kapoor is not the context that I'm talking about. Yeah. But Patricia no. was also speaking, trying to a little bit create a tension between how do your curators react to the fact of working for you who are, is, a, is a vile commercial uh, operator vis-a-vis -vis mm. working for the MoMA? And One and thing that you should remember is that curators are not paid when they work for the MoMA. <laughs> Alan is paying them, so... Um, not, not, not a huge sum, but they get paid, they get paid <laughs> yeah. Let's something. Let's talk about the sum. <laughs> <laughs> they, they get they get the free no. Oftentimes we tell them this is the budget of the show. If you spend more, you get paid less. If you spend less, you get paid more. It's your. It's but they up get to you. they <laughs> get they get free dim sum. So we're getting to the place I wanted to get. And um, one thing um, f uh, important from that point of view is that we were listening this morning to um, Filipino curator um, uh, artist this morning, and they said in the art world, people have to be aware of that. You know. They're saying we're creating works for the stomach and we're creating works for the mind. Mm. So even as artists, they were saying, because everybody wants painting and they are not doing painting. So they are in fact creating painting for the stomach. Mm. Uh, but they don't like those works. They want to do the mind. So I just wanted to open a little door is that people are aware in what kind of games we're playing. What if? Can I just add, just, just, um, I just want to add that the, um, the art programming at Dados is made possible with the support of, um, of, our, of, a, of a commercial patron, uh, which happens to be uh, a Ruinart Champagne. So we wouldn't have any money to, to do any of our exhibitions without the support of this partner. And I guess, um, you know, when you look at kind of the whole, just kind of the whole ecosystem, you have obviously the venue itself, then you have kind of a luxury brand type of partner, mm -hmm. and then you have, obviously you have the art as well. Yeah. It's, there's, there's, and then obviously there's kind of money in, be in between, you know, this, this kind of realm. Mm. So. M my question, my question is, um, what if we shift the focus on um, the goals that we're trying to achieve here? Right, when we present art in the public as patrons. Um, if we're actually talking about having a focused environment, maybe the restaurant might not qualify 
uh, in the strictest sense. But what if our objective is about education? What about what if our objective is about increasing visibility of art and artists? Now, do we have artists here in the audience who would like to comment? Is there a are there artists here? No artists? Only collectors? Yes? Yeah, uh, yes. would you, if you're an artist, would you like your restaurant, uh, your, 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 your work to be featured in a restaurant? Uh, oh, you see. And how was the experience? What, how was it presented? Were you happy with it? So the curator picked your work. And so did you mind that your, your work is located in, um, is in, a, in a space that's not traditionally uh, associated with art? Uh, no, because my work is centered around value and how value is created. So I'm so very interested. So that's the context that you're looking yeah. for. I was very interested in this. How do you, how is, how are things seen outside of a white box? Mm. So I've, yes. I've always liked art in domestic environments. I think that things can look very good in a white box, but then you bring it into a domestic environment and it doesn't look good anymore. So somehow the strength of a work and its identity and sort of erratic value can still exist with the personality of the collector. Mm. I, I, it kind of annoys me when you go to someone's house and the house looks like a gallery. I prefer to have my work shown in a house that kind of feels like a home and that the collectors have a fully formed life and their personality shines. So can I, can I ask if you were given another uh, opportunity to, to, let's just say, share your work um, in a mall, in a restaurant, would you, would you, would you agree to it? I would only agree if the curator, I trusted the curator. Uh -huh. So this is the engagement. Because the curator is able to locate your work in a suitable context. Exactly. So it is not just the placement of a work in an environment, but it's in a way that's relevant to the context that's being presented. Thank you. <laughs> that's an important perspective. Um, yeah, Jim, you know, I, I want to come back to you because um, you, uh, we were talking about patronage here and new forms of patronage. And I remember in our conversation, you mentioned that when you, when you started with this idea of starting an artist residency and there were all this art produced and you thought immediately that the people would come, that there would be engagement. And... How, how was that process and what actually led to the outpost in Manila? Um, well, first of all, we, um, when I first started the residencies, that was around 2013 um, to 2016, we were doing everything quite informally without a curator. And this is why I emphasize the importance of the curator and the artistic director, because knowing that I'm not one myself. Um, and that's a totally different type of specialization. But before that, we were doing things very casually, um, inviting artists to do like workshops and, and different types of like small projects, um, up until the point where Not Vital, a Swiss uh, artist, decided to do a chapel with us. Um, this is purely by chance as well. A good friend of mine who works... Hello? Yeah. Oh. A good friend of mine who works with Not Vital um, introduced us, and uh, we instantly became friends, um, established that trust, and immediately we started building this chapel together with him. It wasn't a commission or an acquisition in the traditional sense. Um, this was in Bataan, about 20 minutes away from the resort, the Las Casas Filipinas Resort, and uh, it was a two-year project where um, there was no sort of no rush, no pressure to open at a certain date. Um, and it was very, very special. And in between 
that relationship with not people started noticing what we were doing because also we're all kind of ambassadors of each other and like what we do the art world is a very social place and so instantly through recommendations not would say you have to work with this artist and you know you need to establish this program and so that led to kind of establishing the um, a proper program with um, Diana Campbell Betancourt, our first artistic director. So, how was the response to the programs that you were you were uh, you you were launching from uh, in Bataan? Um, well, there was hardly any response because we were so far away. Um, there was also this problem of explaining a very complex concept to people where they didn't really understand why are you building that chapel? Is it a Catholic chapel? No. Is it for like rent? No. Um, is it open to the public? Mm, no. Like there was a lot of these things and it was, the reason why I say unusual is because it felt right at the moment to work with Not um, and my father included as well and we just kind of wanted to um, embark on this project with him. Um, so that was the difficulty of bringing people in and getting them excited. And um, I guess an article came out about the chapel um, uh, a few years ago um, from Wallpaper Magazine, and that led to a lot of interest abroad and locally as well. Um, yeah. So then you set up your outpost in uh, Kiapo. Right um, in Manila, Manila. In, oh, sorry, yeah. in, in Manila, in order to actually uh, have a wider reach of people. Yeah. So when we realized that a lot, there's a lot of interest from people to see what we were doing and to try the attempt to understand the uh, foundation. Um, I thought that maybe it's best to go closer to where the audience is, and be able to do the residencies and exhibit projects in the middle of the central business district of Manila. Sure. Um, the, sorry, I know it's so, 10 seconds, so, 10 words. Uh, Elan, what, how you have this loft, right? I mean, she, um, Jam actually talked about having a space, but people not quite knowing what it is and when can they go in, can they visit, is it private, is it public? How did you sort your situation to um, open it your collection to the public and then you know having this artist residency uh, you know having an artist take take care of the collection when he was there now how did you send the message that it is available is it available to the public um, whoever who wants to visit it yeah we like I said earlier it's really by chance and experimentation it was not a plan I didn't stand up one day I said oh I want a residency oh I want a, a, a no it was something that happened as I described by by evolution. The same way, we're not open to the general public because otherwise I've got to have the fireman coming in the, in the thing and they will put exits there and this, and Alan knows this. I mean, it's very problematic when you do this. So I said, no, it's an appointment only. But we are, for example, in that very well-known BMW guide of private collections. So we get um, uh, requests and uh, as far as I know, there's been, never been a refusal to do um, to do um, a, a request. How uh, many people actually ask to visit in a week? I would no. I would say we we welcome approximately fifteen hundred um, to two thousand people per year. Okay. Okay. So and they they knock on your door. They write. No, to no. You? They they write us. Uh, the, the address is not um, listed, even if pe where people know it. Um, but it, it happened in in those sense. But that, that's not the most important. We have also schools. Uh, we love schools, uh, to have schools, because we think that art is about opening up the minds, as I said, you know, giving people the, um, the will to, to try something else, to think some uh, different, differently. So that's the, the way. The residency, it's also not formal. Um, you know, I was sitting down after visiting uh, M Plus um, two years ago. I sat down with an artist I knew, and he had um, a Hong Kong friend, and we started discussing. I told him, oh, you know, we have... Um, a residency would you would like to visit um, and to stay oh my visa is still valid so let's come so it's uh, it's really again I insist on the informality of what we do which give um, very nice experiences so we have also curators because creators often have not more money than than artists so why should not not stay 
in the um, in the residency as well. So that's um, that's a little bit the uh, the idea. But I think it goes about the fact that art is about um, uh, sharing. I mean, it's a, it's a human experience. It's a human interaction. It's not about owning object and and doing it that way. And that's why one of my important message. I think if you excuse me, Mr. Operator, hello. Can you put me in my, the text I, I, I gave on the slides? I, mean, I, I really like that description. It's, it's col a collectors, um, Pakistani collector, Hong Kong based. Um, and they really um, express very well um, the way, again, it happened by accident. Because you start collecting uh, in a private way. Um, I remember Hulit Zik. I'm really I'm a fan of Hulit Zik. Um, um, I'm a fan of Ulizik, and he said, you know, there are three levels of collecting. The first level of collecting is buying what you like, uh, and very often it's, it's dependent on what you hear. The second is um, you start buying according to a theme, you know, Chinese art and things. And then a third level is about creating links. And in the same way, I really like what those collectors said. Uh, we've been collected for more than 20 years, and our approach has changed. Um, it was almost always mostly about our personal experience as you grow from being a collector to a patron and this is what the talk is about you know when you move you know again you don't decide you know some collectors make that step and some don't they keep collecting for themselves and it's about that that will of sharing um and it's it, it's in your personality or not i know people that just want to keep for themselves some wants to share so sometimes you you happen and it's for me it happened by accident as i said from being a collector to a patron, it becomes more about the viewer experience. So I, I'm thinking when I'm acquiring the work, how will the, the people react? You know, for example, um, my collection turned some way. I remember Jerry Saltz when uh, Donald Trump was elected. He said, what can, what can we do with art? And he said, one way is to try to expand art to a larger audience. Because art is, is a place where you can think. But very often, art is too um, navel glazing. I mean, it's too, too complicated about the theory of Lacan and blah, blah, blah. And people cannot access that. So uh, he said, we must make art a little bit more accessible. So some people criticize my collection, for example, for saying it's, it's too literal. But I like the fact that the people can, um, of the general public, can relate to it. So I'm finishing with the, this so viewer experience, because this is what drives you. So the collection moves beyond yourself and to others. Mm -hmm. But what is very, very nice is that last element of the sentence. And the energy comes back to you. Mm -hmm. Because it is giving you back a lot. And I, I know, for example, I had another friend collector in Washington. He started trying to, for the city to build um, a kind of a private space. And I said, oh, so you finished collecting. Because I know that many of those collectors that get engaged in the sharing so much, in fact, they lose the interest in the acquiring side. Because it's taking time, energy, cost. But in fact, you're getting so much more of that energy back that you don't need to acquire those works where you say to your friend, oh, look at my new this or my new Gucci bag or my new... Um, uh, um, whatever. I don't know the brand. Mm. So, but so, well, two of our patrons here are... They don't, they don't claim to be collectors, even privately, you sort of buy works. We've talked about that. Jem, do you collect? Uh, not really, not, act, not actively in the sort of art world sense of collecting. But um, I think for us, the way we approach um, providing support is as a nonprofit, um, and is really kind of understanding what's needed um, in a, an ecosystem like in the Philippines where there's a lot of things lacking. Um, and it's not just about artistic production, but also um, publications, um, providing spaces for talks that, um, like in, in our, for the next phase of the outpost, um, creating an educational platform. The outpost in Manila. The outpost is in Manila. So what I failed to explain earlier is that we built an exhibition space in Manila um, as a way to bring in an audience for our projects. Um, so the outpost is um, also has an art library where a lot of people that we've um, that friends of ours and 
partner institutions have donated books to. Um, and it's a, sort of a rare venue for, for the public that they can access these books um, for free. Um, it's really, I mean, in the beginning, it was kind of a space that we imagined to be um, a host for our talks. And we also thought that uh, because it's free, that people will come and access the books. But actually, it's not always the case. There's, you really have to make an active sort of, um, you have to really design a program to get people to come in and, and access what the resources that are made available. Um, and so anyway, going back to, I just wanted to go into this idea of patronage and, and support. And one thing that I'd like to kind of ask um, the people in the panel is why, if they th think that that um, form of support is what's needed, or is it coming from an interest and then finding a way to um, support through that interest. Because in the Philippines, um, we're very lucky in the Philippines in what, on the one hand because the, the very vibrant art scene of the Philippines is supported by a grassroots community. They've never, I mean, in instances there has been support from like corporates, um, from collectors, of course, but um, there is this very strong Knit, a closely knit community of artists, curators. Um, and so in order to support that, you need to build those relationships with the artists and the community. And there's a sense sometimes, I wonder if you, anyone has, had to, has struggled with that idea of how, what do we support? Like, because a lot of us are putting a lot of time, effort, and money into things. And because we're speaking to an audience here in Singapore in the middle of an art fair, I kind of want to um, go away from the idea of collecting also as a form of support since we've talked about it a lot. But like, how can we support the local ecosystem through other ways, um, especially in a very, like, relatively young, emerging, and incredibly rich, financially rich, and culturally rich region like Southeast Asia. But I just want to make um, one comment. It's, it's remarkable what you do. I mean, um, because getting involved in the art without the collecting is just out of pure generosity, okay? So I, again, and I, I've always that question of whether Mother Teresa was very generous because maybe she really enjoyed being, you know, Mother suffering Teresa, that much. Or, but so it's true. So it's true. We never know. But um, I, I find that it, I got there through collecting. You started saying, "I don't want those works," and you are one of those few people, you know, like the Sam Danis, um, Sandra Mullier in Paris, uh, with the. Um, some foundation, so I first w want to say my admiration and the generosity of the, of the whole process because this is patronage. Mm. You know, what I do is I'm sharing my passion, and, mm. but when I turn off the light and I close the door, I'm still home and enjoying my works. Mm. So, and you get left with nothing except the experience in some way. Yes, so well said. No, I mean, yeah, the, I think what we're, because, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but but um, a lot of it comes from frustration as well. When you have had a, an experience from, let's say, for me in my case in Europe, where there are a lot of um, places to enjoy art, and you know you can go to the gallery and buy something. You can go to a museum and see a crazy um, uh, work from a commission from the Turbine Hall. So your idea of art is very broad, and so it came from also a very genuine sort of like interest to um, like need to um, allow things to happen in the Philippines that uh, or kind of take part in more non-commercial activity 
And um, also, I just wanted to hang out with artists. Honestly, <laughs> That's I really do. That's, That's your excuse. Uh, well, I want to hear more from Alan uh, later and um, Jem and uh, Elant. But um, I've just got prompting to have questions from the floor because uh, we're running out of time. Thanks. I feel like it's um, being moderated as it's a bit of an education to the Singaporean audience. So to get some tangible ideas, what does the three moderators feel? Singapore patrons or the budding patrons who want to be attributed that title can do to make the Singapore art scene even better? Is it a restaurant with an integrated art program? Is it a very distinctive, et cetera, et cetera? No, what can, what can what can Singaporean patrons do to make contribute to the art scene in Singapore? Um, art is a very strange um, virus. Um, it's something that needs a certain environment to um, to thrive. Um, I have the chance of visiting maybe 15, 20 different cities around the world, and you you get to a kind of typography about what makes a successful art scene. The thing is that you need to have the whole range or you have nothing. Uh, and we, I spoke yesterday about, um, about this to um, someone quite responsible in the, into the higher sphere of, of, um, of Singapore. The thing is that art needs chaos. You know, for me, art, you know, that's what the beauty of, of and the craziness of Philippines in one way. But this, and I was in Bangkok just um, before arriving here. But I've never seen art getting, you know, giving, giving birth um, from, you know, something so clean as a Singaporean street in many ways. So, <laughs> so that's a little bit the challenge of, of Singapore, is you need more chaos if you want the art. <laughs> and you don't want the chaos, so you can push as much money and then we will, I'll be honest, huh? Patricia, I mean, everybody knows I'm honest, so we will enjoy the money. Uh, you know, people will enjoy the money, so what you can set up for, for this, the different scenes around the, count, the, the region to come in. The problem is that the different countries are developing their own offer, which then puts Singapore in a quite difficult position. So my, my, th my sense would be, you know, inject more chaos because I don't think patrons can, can develop it by themselves and neither the state can create it by themselves. So chaos. I think the community needs to, needs to be interested in art in the first place. So I think uh, there's no, I think there's, I think there's, um, there's a sense of that, uh, a certain kind of top-down vision to create, to create um, uh, a hub or something or whatever, whatever it's called. Does the uh, Hong Kong community, are they interested in art when? I think, um, you know, we've always been known you know, for for decades we've all, we've been known as the cultural desert, so there's there, there's kind of a certain kind of perception that n nobody has any interest in culture. People are just interested in money in Hong Kong. Well, Singapore and Hong Kong are um, so I but but somehow um, it developed. Um, well, well, one must understand that it d didn't just happen overnight. It didn't just start 10 years ago with Art Hong Kong and some fairs. You know, we, we, actually in our city, people, you know, the, when you look at um, Chinese antiquities and, and um, uh, Chinese uh, ink and all that, I mean, actually, we, Hong Kong and maybe Taiwan has some of the earliest patrons and collectors of in, in those categories. But then... Um, I suppose, you know, in the essence of time, I think people are actually more ready than you think. Um, I mean, I think 10, 10 years ago, 15 year, years ago, when we started talking about building a major museum in Hong Kong, everyone would be like, no, the audience, you know, the public is not ready for this. But, I mean, you look at, you look at, you look at the public days in Art Basel in Hong Kong, I mean, it's like basically people treat it now as like kind of like a temporary museum 
show, because you know, we don't really have a world class museum. In, Hopefully, it comes within the next 24 months. So your, your, your <laughs> point is education, yeah? Education and... Exposure. Exposure and education. Yes, Eva. We have one last question. Is this a long, one last question? I'm Sorry. the last one? No. Uh, yes. And then after that, you can talk to the speakers themselves directly. Okay, yes. just, just, well, thank you. Just a short question. Um, I've seen the work uh, of a Bulgarian um, artist on the ground side. And it reminds me of something. I don't know if you have a limit or you think there is a wrong patronage doing. Like, if there is something for you that you will never do as a patronage, or what is the weirdest or the most strange petition or, 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 or um, I don't know, offer for a patronage? Like, from an artist coming from a... I don't know, from a, any person in the art world asking you to do something as a patronage. If you can share an anecdote. <laughs> as you know, um, Eva, um, my way of surviving on this earth is to um, focus on what I like and forget about what I don't like. So I have no examples. Um, uh, really particular answer to this. We, we must not forget, yes, maybe one thing. We must not forget that the art world is nothing else than the world. And that's really something extremely important. You know, what scares me sometimes is the way the art world is, is, is seem to be split from the real world. And in the same way as in the art, in the real world, there are good people and bad people in all categories. You know, um, I'm fighting sometimes that people on Twitter respect the billionaire like uh, Warren Buffett or uh, George Soros or, or people like this because it's not because they're wealthy that they are bad people and, and vice versa uh, in some way. But one thing which disturbs me sometimes is that you have the good guys and the bad guys. Um, for example, artists are supposed to be always fantastic. No, artists are selfish. Uh, they're <laughs> self-centered. Uh, they they're like everyone else. And, and, and in, a, and in a way, again, I'm not saying that, but I'm against that idea that, oh, oh, we have to, we have to bend because the artist. No, you have to bend to Alan or, or Jam for sure, more, more to a Jam than to Alan. But, um, and, me, and to me as well, as I said earlier. But it, what I mean is there's no wrong, right or wrong, but there's no, no one is purer than anything else. And the same way sometimes as a collector, uh, I remember we were trying to support an art fair, a non-profit art fair in Brussels. And the guys, which are kind of a little bit, you know, uh, anti-capitalist and everything, we were really willing to help them by giving them an exhibition that would bring attention to them. And we would pay everything from the guard, the transport, the insurance, everything. And the guy were looking at us and said, can anything good come from wealthy people? And they really had to have a, 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 a discussion among themselves to say, do we allow those guys or do we close them out? Um, so, you know, no prejudgments um, of, any, of any type. That's the only okay. thing I would say in terms of patronage. Thank you. Quick answer because he's indicating yeah. end of session. Uh, yes. I'd just like yes. to... Um, of thought. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Uh, art and money is always linked. I mean, it has been for the last, okay. I don't know how many centuries. Um, so, uh, f for us in the Philippines, um, or at least how I think about it, it's, uh, it's always difficult to talk about privilege, especially in a country where so much privilege is given to so little. Um, and the compos and it's funny because the art scene um, it's become so cool now to be part of the art scene. Everyone's trying to penetrate into the circles. I want to be a collector, I want to be a patron, I want to do this and that. Um, and I find I'm actually quite, I had a very difficult time at first um, engaging with the local scene. I, I had to prove my commitment to them. And it was, and it's, it wasn't like necessarily easy. I see people in the audience that were instantly friends of mine and were very encouraging, but it was not an easy thing in the beginning. And <laughs> time's up. Yeah. Um, the, so going back to just f <laughs> drawing from my experience with what we've done in a place like the Philippines, um, what I saw with 
I don't know what to tell people from Singapore, for example, because I don't know the ecosystem here as well as I know the Philippines, but I think freedom needs to be given to artists. And I don't know, maybe you should ask yourself, are we giving artists enough freedom here? Is that, I think that when you don't give artists freedom to execute their ideas, total freedom, I think that you might get stuck somewhere. Um, and build a relationship with art where you have certain expectations of what art should be rather than just looking and kind of really engaging with it. And going back to your question, is there anything too crazy that we've encountered? Actually, no, because they're all really crazy. And the, whether it goes from like a really crazy idea, we narrow it down to something more pragmatic I'll give the example being the Achillesans, for example, who gave the talk earlier. Um, they wanted to transfer the ground floor of an entire house into the outpost, our exhibition space. And at first it sounded really crazy and then we sat down, we're like, how do we do this? We brought in the engineers and the architects from our construction company. They were like, actually, it's not so bad. Like, we can do this, 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 and this is what we need. And so we brought the thing in of course with many challenges, but it was a spectacular show as a result. So, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the right way to do it, but the principle that we live by is really giving artist, total artistic freedom, I think is fundamental in supporting, um, uh, being a patron for supporting the arts. Okay, but, but so I, we I, have I, a I chaos, we have, we have we I'll have push freedom. it a little bit further, <laughs> giving names in those experiences, because the artist you said yourself, and that's sometimes, again, the limit that I would put to some artists is Kendall Gears, uh, Alexander, <laughs> no, no, Celine knows about him, is um, one day told me, you know, I became a big star in the 1990s. Everybody was giving me shows and everything. So I wanted to, to know how far I could push it. So Ahal Zeman wanted, the big Ahal Zeman wanted to give me a show in Ghent. And I said, well, uh, I, I don't know. Um, let's see how far I can push him. And he said, okay, I'll do a show, but then the show will be you going to um, a domina, an SM domina, sadomasochistic domina, so, you know, in the dungeon. Uh, you having a session in a dungeon, and the only thing we would get would be the recording of your <laughs> session. And then, of course, he said no. Then eventually, I said, no, no, that's what I want, that's what I want, that's what I want. Eventually, Arad Zeman did it, okay? So it's a way sometimes for the artist to say, how, where, how far can I push the system? Uh, and it's funny uh, in some cases, but sometimes I think we must be able to say no because it's too much. Alan? Parting words? Wow. <laughs> Parting words. I think we've soaked into way too much already. <laughs> La, then we, we're done with this session and they can approach you directly. Any? Thank you. Yeah.